Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we ask you to please take your seats. The program is about to begin. We ask you to please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Thank you. Hi there. If you haven't already and you'd like to, can you please have a seat? Thank you. All right. Can you guys hear me in the back? Can you wave if you can? All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Toronto Region Board of Trades live recording of the Curse of Politics podcast. We want to thank our principal sponsors, Scotiabank, SNC-Lavalin, 
Globe and Mail and the University of Toronto for this event. For those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Lindsay Broadhead and I'm the Senior Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs at the Toronto Region Board of Trade. As we gather here, I want to acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Na'achnabak, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that Toronto is is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. The board is Canada's largest Chamber of Commerce, representing over 11,000 members. We connect, convene, and champion the business issues that matter most for ensuring growth and competitiveness in our region, and we've been doing it since 1845. We advocate for the, matters that ma the issues that matter most to our region, whether it's for better transit, housing, keeping our talent here in our region, our climate economy, or unlocking the economic potential of business regions, the board is the ground floor for representing our members' voices to decision makers. On that note, I understand that our past chair, Peter Hamont, is here. Is that true? Can he give a wave if he's here? Is he here? He's not here. Let's all acknowledge him from afar, shall we? Thank you. Um, elections are always important moments, and for the policy wonks in the room, this is your Super Bowl. But few elections are about choosing a government that will set the course for rebuilding our economy after a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. That's why this election matters so much. The pandemic saw our small businesses shutter, our supply chains crippled, and our economy contract. Ontario took a big hit when it came to our competitiveness, and now battered but not bruised, or broken, a little bruised, but not broken, we're ready to chart the course to not just recovery, but to a robust period of productivity and growth. But which political party has the right strategy to get us there? I'm sure many in this room think they know, but today we're gonna to find out the answer to that question for certain, as we have the political experts of the P Curse of Politics podcast in the house. So out of the gates, because I'm a fangirl of the Hurley Burley and Curse of Politics, it feels like these two facts may be my minimum cost of entry before I introduce the panel. Okay, first, I'm a little nervous. My first concert was the Beach Boys. Because of the era, Brian Wilson was not there and John Stamos was on drums. It was a very confusing time in musical history. <laughs> Second, for those of you who may find the M word offensive, please plug your ears. I am a Maple Leafs fan. <laughs> Wendell Clark is the best Leaf of all time, number 17, and I won't hear otherwise. With that, it is my great pleasure to welcome David Hurley, former senior advisor to Prime Minister Paul Martin and Premier Kathleen Wynne, and now principal partner at polling firm, the Gandalf Group. <laughs> Jenny Byrne is the former senior advisor to Prime Minister Stephen Harper and Premier Doug Ford, is currently on the campaign of, Pri of Pierre Polyev and CEO of government and public relations firm Jenny Byrne and Associates. <laughs> and last but definitely not least, Scott Reed is former senior advisor to Prime Minister Paul Martin and currently principal at communications firm Fezchuk Reed. Together, of course, they are the cast of everyone's favorite political podcast, The Curse of Politics. Now, for those of you who are new to The Curse of Politics, hold on tight, because we're about to go on a fun and fast ride. It's a safe bet that these three are the only panel who can speak passionately about the relative merits of a Harry Styles drag performance and skill at Coachella, and blend seamlessly and strangely into Ontario election polling, as if the two subjects were a natural pairing. For the comms folks in the audience, the podcast includes a masterclass, as I've shared with my three and a half uh, Twitter followers, in advertising, <laughs> delivery, and impactfulness. And perhaps most notably, you quickly come to appreciate how a litany of four-letter words can each be eloquently delivered as nouns, verbs, adjectives, and oddly standalone sentences alike. Oh, and they are three of the most intelligent uh, political observers that we know. This is, of course, why we're really here and there's an open bar. Just a note, these guys are recording live, so please save your questions till after. I'll be back to moderate a Q&A portion, so gather your questions if you have them. 
Um, and then we'll get to the good stuff afterwards too, drinking and mingling. So with that, let's begin and with a round of applause for our pod. That's pretty amazing, hey? Yes. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> First of all, we haven't seen each other in a hell of a long time until we met at Highs just a couple of hours yes. ago. Yes. So. That's right. <laughs> it was a pre-meet. It was a pre-meet. Not a pre-drink, a pre-meet. Yeah. Everyone's here having a drink at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> or as we call that, a late start. <laughs> um, it's funny to have uh, speak in front of a crowd like this because really what the podcast is, is just the three of us sitting around as if we were in a bar or in a coffee shop talking about politics. And we'd and all come in. And the haves and other uh, things in life. And Harry's though. When, <laughs> and normally when we do that, people move away from us in the bar or the coffee <laughs> shop. So to have people actually coming to the event is... Uh, it's a little shocking, and I'm not sure we know what to do up here to entertain you. But we'll uh, we'll get we'll get into it. Um, we'd like to tell you that this is like a really tight, uh, close race. That there's like some key decisions in the last week. They're going to determine everything. But the entire Ford campaign team is here, uh, <laughs> right there. Uh, and they're all wearing Team Jenny T-shirts. They're wearing Team Jenny T-shirts. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, Scott and I have been scouring the room for Don oh. Guy. We do not see him anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, and that, that indicates, I think, um, a level of reality about the election that as we head into the last week, there seems to be a pretty settled and solid trajectory, which is that the Conservatives in vote intention are in the high 30s. Um, and the Liberals are in the mid-20s to high-20s, and the NDP are in the low-20s to mid-20s. And all that adds up to a Conservative majority government, and those voting patterns have been stable, stable, stable through the entire writ period of this election campaign. Those fun fundamental dynamics have not shifted. And as we've discussed on the pod before, I know none of you listened, but as we've discussed on the, port, on the pod before, Ford's lead is probably bigger than it appears because he's very strong among older voters and likely is to have a better turnout than the other parties. So I thought we'd start tonight by just talking about how it is we got into this situation because it wasn't always a predictable situation. There were definitely times in the last four years when it looked like Doug Ford could easily lose an election. In fact, there were times when it looked like it might be difficult for him to win an election. Um, and so the fact that he's cruising confidently toward re-election is an interesting phenomenon. And I think we're, we're all going to talk about it. I'm going to start by putting my proposition on the table. I think, first of all, it's, it's not unreasonable to say that COVID saved Doug Ford. Um, I think because it injected um, a completely external event into his government that totally changed the way governments were being perceived by their populations and gave him an agenda that was roughly consonant with what the public wanted his agenda to be, which had not been the case in the first year of his government. So, I mean, he was, before COVID, in a really bad place um, with Ontarians. And COVID came along and allowed him to find a different footing. In the last year, uh, there, some of them are here. I'm not going to mention anybody by name, but he's brought in professional management of the government and the campaign and the whole and, thing. And also Corey. And also, <laughs> and, and also Corey. Uh, and they found, they found two things. They found a message that would animate enough people to elect them, which is the vote yes, vote development, build things, let's get this province going forward. And they found ways to get everybody else not to care as much whether he continued on as, as uh, premier. So they scraped the edges off the opposition so that among the people that don't want him to be premier, there aren't, that, there aren't enough who really care strongly about that in order to shape their vote decision, strategically vote, cast aside. And I think in the face of that, in the face of that, the opposition parties almost have to conclude they decided to run for second, both of them. 
Um, and they have concentrated most of their campaigns on appealing to the same group of voters as the other one and to try to outbid the other one for the support of those voters. And the result is that they're splitting that. Nobody's won that contest. The other consequence of that is nobody has even really tried to lay a glove on Doug Ford. There has not been any concerted negative attack on Doug Ford either through uh, advertising, paid media, or through uh, leaders' tours and earned media. To the extent that they've been rough, they've been rough with each other, the NDP and the Liberals, more than they've been rough with Ford. And so there has been nothing to put the Conservatives off their game, nothing to change the message they would have on any given day. Um, and, uh, and so I... Uh, that's how I think we got here today. That's, that would be my overall take. Jenny, what do you think? Yeah, no, there, there is most I uh, agree with you uh, in terms of uh, uh, where we are today. I do think that uh, Doug uh, completely, uh, uh, he, during COVID, he absolutely appealed to a extreme broad sense of, of the population. I know you started calling him Doug, um, Scott. Yes, I did. I called him Didi is actually my na name for him. <laughs> You're on a first name basis with two people in that government, Doug and Peter. And Peter Buffalo. the Doug. Excuse me, Bethan. Bethan. Bethan Falvey. Bethan Falvey. Bethan Falvey. Bethan Falvey. Um, so no, I agree with that. Go I also think we're in the position, email. listen, I, I uh, and I'm not saying this because I have friends wearing t-shirts with my names on them uh, in the front row. I think that uh, the conservative candidate campaign has run a very strong campaign, a very disciplined campaign. Discipline is the number one thing that you want uh, in an election campaign. It, it is uh, something that people do not think about uh, uh, in terms of how you think. They think exciting. We, you, you think contrast ads. You think negative. Um, but discipline is very hard. We know how hard it is to be disciplined, especially if you, you're... Not Rick Hahn in that deep tissue massage he gave Doug Ford in the star <laughs> yesterday um, was referring to that discipline and how the fact that he wouldn't even take the bait from Del Duca. Like yeah, Del Duca would say, say terrible things about him and he would just... But discipline is very, is very hard to do. Like, it's, it's like, think about when anyone here, if you guys are being attacked on Twitter for something that you've said, it's very hard to not engage into a fight on Twitter. So to be disciplined in terms of a campaign is almost the hardest thing to do. And so Doug, Doug and the Conservative campaign has been very uh, disciplined. And then you've also had, David, to your point of this, a very discombobulated both NDP and uh, Liberal campaign. So at the start of this campaign, we talked about that if Stephen Del Duca wanted to make any major inroads, he was going to have to bring the Del Duca brand at least competitive with the Liberal Party of Canada brand. Because the Liberal Party of Canada brand, you liberals in the room, you're really fucking lucky that you have one of the uh, most salient, um, strong brands in the entire Western world, the Liberal Party of Canada, ergo the Liberal Party of Ontario. So he had to kind of try to, uh, try to uh, aspire to that. And there's been no evidence that that is the case. And they decided to run a very leader-centric uh, leader campaign, which has turned out to be a mistake for them. And so I think we find ourselves um, where we're at um, uh, based on campaign decisions that different war rooms have made. And we've all been in war rooms where we made right decisions, and we've been in war rooms that have made wrong decisions. And I think that uh, at the end of the day, we're in a position where we have the Ford campaign that has made a lot of right decisions. Uh, we've had a Del Duca campaign that has made, um, I think, wrong decisions in terms of the strategic overview. And I think you have an NDP campaign that is making almost no decisions in terms of where they're, wh what they're, they're actually in terms of. You know, one of the things that's perplexed me, Jen, is why did the Liberals and the NDP think the best way to win the progressive primary was to fight each other yeah. as opposed to to show the voters that they were both trying to appeal to that they were the strongest anti-Ford voice. But they weren't fighting each other. Up until like last week, they weren't fighting each other. I think they mostly have been. Mostly. Hey? I don't think so. Fight for first and fall to second. No, no fight fighting for, for first. Second. Fighting That's for first. My... Fighting for first, though, is going against the Tories. So... That's what I mean. Fight for no. first and fall and, and fall to second. Don't fight for second. And they made the mistake of fighting for second, both of them. I think. Yeah, and and deem themselves irrelevant. We've seen that probably both war rooms went off this long, past long weekend, um, and sat and went riding painstakingly, riding by riding by riding by riding, as to which ridings we are going to win. Which is why 
the top secret leaked memo by the Liberal campaign, um, basically said that. They, are, they, they sat down there and they looked at the ridings that they can pick up and they are predominantly, if not all, in the NDP category, which is why they're throwing out the, if you want to stop a potential Doug Ford majority, um, you've got to vote for us because the NDP have no chance. And so, right. um, I, but, but you know, there are ways that war rooms, when they're planning this stuff, can actually try to like do two prongs and neither campaign seem to actually, like, it's, it's a reality. They are actually fucking fighting themselves on a lot of the ridings. So, so they can say yeah. they're, they're, they're they, they can say they're running against uh, Doug Ford in Toronto Centre, but they're not running against Doug Ford in Toronto Centre. I so, believe that they would have been better off. You, you seem to not want to let Scott talk. I don't really want to let Scott talk. We were at highs. <laughs> we were at highs. He refused to eat. You were begging him to eat. I had a nosebleed. I had a nosebleed. He had a nosebleed, and I think he was so afraid I mean, that I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't want Scott to talk. I personally believe <laughs> that either one of them would, be, would have been better off Rather than trying to convince people that one had the better parental leave plan than the other one, to convince people that they had the better anti-Ford diagnosis than the other one, that they were the ones, the true fighters against the Ford government. Fighters. fighters. You go. Come on. What do you think? Well, I think the knock on David Hurley is that he'd rather fight than fuck, and that's always been certainly since what I'm, takes certainly you to since this I'm 40. Position. No, look, I want to start. <laughs> Okay, welcome. You really should have Welcome to the floor room, everybody. My name's Don Rickles. Red Fox is next to me. Um, you I wanna, really should have had a beef slider at highs. There we should have, yeah. I want to start um, by acknowledging the fact that Corey Tanak, the, 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 the campaign manager for Ford, is in the room. I do want to name names. And Corey, I want to say to you that my mother called me two days ago and said, are you still friends with that Corey guy? And I said, yes. <laughs> And she says, will you tell him that I am so mad at him? How can people be so goddamn stupid to vote for that Ford guy? And so she's very wound up about the discipline of the campaign. She's very, very upset that COVID isn't a prominent issue in the campaign. What is Corey supposed to do with that feedback? By He's not. <laughs> not go to my mom's house for lunch, I think, would be the number one thing I would avoid. Um, but I think, I think that... You know, how do we get here? Um, my mother has that diagnosis. Um, it's Corey's fault. That may well be true. I, I think two things. One thing that happened and one thing that didn't happen. The thing that happened is the thing you talked about, David, al already, which is that Ford transformed his relationship with Ontario uh, during COVID. And more than anything else, he established himself as well-intended. And I just don't think in a day and age when people don't pay close attention to the particulars of policy, don't pay uh, close attention to the particulars of politics, they do. And people, people withdraw sort of osmotically an impression, an impression of their leaders. And I think that, you know, there were stumbles, obviously, playgrounds and all that stuff. But I think that by and large, the impression that people withdrew for, for Ford, at least a plurality, if not a majority of voters, was I can't blame them for what's occurred. Uh, and probably give them an even bigger discount than, than deserved on that. So I'm not going to blame them for this, but I am going to reward them for being well-intended. And as a guy who's a populist, who's premier, yes, who wants to say, yep, 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 we get along, hey, folks, hey, my friends, my friends, you know, he put himself in a position where suddenly folks said, oh, he's well-intended. The first year of his government, it didn't make any sense to people. The things they were doing, the way they were behaving, did not feel like he was well-intended. COVID suddenly meant left people with the impression that it was the public interest. Sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong, but he was always trying and he was well-intended and properly motivated. I think the thing that didn't happen is, I would scroll back like a year ago, and I don't think um, that the Liberals uh, decided, I'm gonna particularly concentrate on the Liberals, I don't think that they made- Even though you're our official NDP spokesman. Even though I'm the new Democrat <laughs> on the panel. Uh, thanks brothers and sisters for being here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll see you back at the hall. Um, <laughs> but I think that the Liberals failed to make, you know, they, 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 they said we are going to audition and Del Duca decided they were going to audition for government. So they spent a year not, um, not critiquing Ford, not building any connective tissue between the things that didn't work during COVID 
and the things that people were anxious about going forward and saying, here's the reason you can't trust this guy to manage the thing that's coming, not the thing that's passed. And they didn't go negative, to your point, David. And they didn't establish uh, Del Duca as a personality. So now we find out that Del Duca, even among liberals, isn't actually necessarily a lock as best choice for premier. You know, people either don't know him or they're not blown away by him. And there's no case against Ford. And I hate to say it, people don't like to hear this, but they should have gone negative. So the thing that did happen is that Ford reestablished his relationship with Ontario voters. And then the campaign and a bunch of decisions that folks like pricks like Corey have made have reinforced all that in a, in a very strong, built, massive shielding, hard to penetrate way. And the Del Duca campaign didn't mount any kind of negative case for change. And, and, and inexplicably also didn't establish him as a personality. And so now we're ended up in a world going, well, as you say, who gives a shit what his parental leave policy is? Why is he talking about climate change? What is this, what's the connection uh, to something that would alter my vote? And that's, when you're behind, you have to think, how do I get people to alter their inclination? Um, and that, that hasn't not, happened. But it's not just people, it's liberal voters. Like David, we talked about this morning, what, 50, it's only 51% of liberal voters are absolutely convinced they're voting for the Liberal Party right now. So, so we're in the middle of advanced polls. Yep. Uh, there's there's yep. three more days. Much softer than the other parties. Much Forty nine percent of traditional liberal voters do not know or do but not. But they'd be interested in more information. They're still interested. I like as I'd like, puts it, I'd like a flyer. I'd like a, fly, a flyer would be good. <laughs> <laughs> both sides. If I can really get the full <laughs> dose. You know, I can read it. So we learned. I think we talked about this. We learned in the federal campaign that COVID governments are kind of getting a pass on. Um, and the electorate's reluctant to judge governments on COVID. So, okay, so no matter what you thought of Ford during COVID, leave it aside. Don't relitigate right. it. My mom is wrong, is the Don't point. Don't relitigate it. But what about she the is. first year? Can't you go back to the first year? Like, I'm, I mean, Dean French existed, right? And can't you make Ford carry that around a little bit? Like, I just think of something like these mandate letters. Jesus, you're triggering me, Dean. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> What would, what would, to trigger you some more, what would Pierre Paulia do to Doug? Would he take the locks on like the women's washroom and stuff? Like, <laughs> what was going on behind the scenes? I mean, was that bad in public? Like, you know. Um, what, what, would, what would Pierre Paulia do to Doug Ford in a debate on something like the mandate letters? Right? You would press him. You would press him. You would say, well, is this, it? You, since you won't tell us what's in it, is this in it? Will you deny that this is in it? But nobody gives right? a fuck what's in a mandate letter. Well, no, you can make shit up. You make shit up. Well, you, no, you, you're, gonna, you're, you're supposed to bulldoze to. half of the green belt. But, but you're going right? to. But, no, no, no. But, you're, but, but, but if, if, if someone's going to go after Doug, if you're going to spend your time on mandate letters, no one gives a fuck. Ask the average person. Ask your mom. No, no, sorry. You're misunderstanding. It's not about mandate letters. Would she know what a mandate letter is? It's, she's, just, she's just gunning for Tori. Uh, no, Tory. It's, sorry, <laughs> it's not about mandate letters and the Smooth process of Doug. secrecy. It's about did you instruct your minister to do this? Right. When they were sworn in. Did you or did you not? But what issue is it? Make any one of So you're talking about something. So, so COVID has been the most prolific um, event of probably most of our lifetimes, uh, which lasted for a year and a half to two years. And you're basically saying that, that what the opposition should do would, should be to leap. Here's the real Doug Ford. Here's the guy that when he was before COVID, when everybody gets a pass on COVID. Here's who the guy was. I think, listen, I think it's pretty slim pickings. Um, and uh, at the end I of the day- I can't argue with you there. Yeah. It's slim pickings. Right. Wait, they're gonna run a campaign against Dean French? You, you well, mean, as a, as a, the most, as a the proxy, people, the as people, a proxy. The people that would care most about that was anyone that worked at Queens Park in the first year of the government, not <laughs> the Ontario voters. There's similar, uh, we are cross tabs on the cross uh, players. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with you, David. Uh, not on mandate letters specifically. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's. It. I mean, but that's an illustration, right? But I, it, it goes back to my point about a year ago. I think you needed to establish a year ago a case for change, and you needed to say you needed to recognize whether you liked it or not, whether you, whether you were my mom or not. You needed to recognize. Look, COVID has allowed this guy to reestablish himself as a political personality and define himself in ways that are really pretty concrete. And so I've got to disrupt that. I have to change that. I have to. And I think, you know, like I would pick on a different spot. I'd be saying, you know what, Doug Ford, throughout COVID, here's two, three examples. So I'll just borrow and try to contaminate the COVID experience, but then leap it forward and say, you know, 
Doug Ford isn't looking out for you, he's looking out for our people that can get him on the phone. And there's a handful of people that can get him on the phone and they get what they want done. And Nobody said that. You're the first person to say that in this campaign. Del Duque has not said that. And Mark I don't Beth understand that. that. I would go with that with an ax um, and I would have been going at it a year ago and try to say, you know, because, like if we want to go back a decade, right, there was a, there was a vibe in the city, in the region, about Doug Ford and Rob Ford. And the vibe was, Rob is an adorable fuck up, right? You know, a, you know, you know, literally, right? Like, um, but he's a, he's a nice. Doug's the, Doug's the ball breaker. He's the goof. He's the bully, right? He's the bully. All of that COVID evaporated that bully definition. Completely evaporated it. And I think he needed to figure out a way to demonstrate. No, he is a bully. He is actually not. It's a phony construction that he's there for the people. He's actually just there for certain people who are pals of his. Here's the evidence of it, and I'm going to drill in it. And they needed two scandals in the past 12 months that either they manufactured and defined, right, or they found and they exploited. Um, but they needed something like that. They literally needed to do the hard work of opposition, which is let's build a scandal, put bruises on this guy before he gets in the campaign. But, but in ter- it's too late of, now. No, but in terms in, of talking about days, how Doug handled days. COVID, listen. You should be on top of that. There were, there, were, there, were, there were things about COVID that I did disagreed with the government, as my friends in the first row uh, will know, because I would call and, and tell them I disagreed. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, Doug was anything but partisan or anything about his friends. So he was as, there was no premier that actually uh, hung. Oh, I the, think you can make the case. Hugged the prime minister more than uh, the, than what. It's like the mandate Doug letters, did. Jenny. It's the things we don't know about. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, I, that sounds like a conspiracy theory, and we wouldn't want to peddle in those, Scott. No, 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 no. Sorry, Doctor yeah. Lewis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think that's I think that's unfair. Like Doug was actually the most uh, transparent in terms of who he was working with. Who's that other guy? The Joe Volpe's son, that is a big liberal that you guys are friends with. Uh, Flavio. You Unless you're talking about Flavio, Flavio or Flavio. a friend of mine. Flavio. Oh, sorry. Flavio. You think, you think the liberals should run against Flavio Volpe? Yeah. No, but I'm saying that he is a, he's a liberal, is he not? Yeah, I guess. I don't okay. Know. And, I don't know if he is. And you know? Doug, I mean, and Doug held how many, and Doug did, Doug did initiatives with him. So to say that Doug was, uh, was, was using COVID to like, help his friends and what have you. And I'd go to the board to long-term care. I'd go to the passing the law on long-term care. They, they, they peddled this stuff out on the campaign trail, the Liberals and the NDP in the last 24 hours, but they did it kind of, you know, limp dicked and, you know, late. So, like, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. You got to establish this stuff before the campaign starts, you know. Like, these are all bullets just bouncing off the campaign's chest. All right. Let's move on. From the Ontario election. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Music Excellent. now. Right now. on. Yeah. Okay, let's talk Beach Boys. Let's so, go back Jenny, to where was. there's eight days to go. Yep. You have been, as near as I can tell, in the nerve center of six general election campaigns, federal and provincial. Yes. And nerve center. Nerve center. I use that Neurons to distinguish her firing. from you. Okay? Right. Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, what is it like to be in charge of the campaign with eight days to go? Uh, well, uh, it depends. Uh, so um, there's kind of three, but there's, there, there's three, but I'd say really two major ones. You're either in charge where it looks you're going to win, looks like you're going to win. Um, and, I've heard that. And <laughs> sure thing. It's a lot. <laughs> Take it for granted. <laughs> um, and uh, um, and what you want Everybody. is you want the campaign to fucking end tomorrow. The clock, if there's a clock, it's going like tick, tick, tick. And those are actually worse than the campaigns. Uh, uh, you just want it to end. Every little thing that you're worried about is going to cause a story. You know things are going well. You're looking at your voter ID numbers coming in. The polling is good. Um, uh, your, your opponents haven't um, been able to land a blow, so things are going well. Uh, so those are actually almost most painful for a campaign than, than what, uh, when you're fighting for one, whether you think you're, you're about to win or you're losing. So like for the 2015 campaign, for example, 
Um, uh, those of us that were on the campaign, we, we knew a fair bit out that like it was not looking like it went from, you know, we were in a majority to a minority to losing a minority to like a liberal majority. And when you're into the last kind of week and a half of that, and I assume this is where the liberals and the NDP are at right now, is you're actually just begging for more time because what you what you've kind of forgot about is what's happening at the national level. So you're the the central level. You are now you are now doing what I think the liberals did is you're going seat by seat by seat, and you want the extra time because you think oh if I can just get 50 more fucking votes in Davenport or. 50 more if points. If I can just have five more days, if like the last five days. That like then, it, you know, if it's going to come down to 200 votes, if I just have that little bit of time, I can do it. And so um, there's stress levels that are that are different, like that are very very different. Um, uh, but you know, it, 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 they're both they're both very uh, they're both very uh, tough. Ever. And then then you're in a then you can be in a position where you know you've won um, and you're doing well. And you're kind of cru you're, you're 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 cruising, but you're you're still hoping nothing bad happens. But it's a pretty good uh, it's a pretty good feeling. In a Jenny Byrne campaign, how many people are left in headquarters right now? Uh, it's du it's dwindled already. Um, this is the when you, you start to like push push people out into like uh, into the riding. So yeah. uh, you're in. It's it's a little bit different provincially. provincially. Explain that because I don't know the people who listen to the pod necessarily know that, right? Like how the campaign headquarters. Is. So once you start, so you can vote almost on any day of an election, but advanced polls are like the big thing. So for Ontario, or for Ontario though, it's different. It's what ten days of advanced polls this time, and so this is the longest bit of advanced polls. And more people are voting in advanced polls than used to, right? I'm looking over. Yes. Yes. No. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, well, not not and, because not thanks And so, but but uh, but when you have like what, once you start getting the vote out, you're starting pushing people out. So uh, and it starts with different people in communications and what have you, because your focus becomes on. No, 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 no. Those are the last soldiers. You don't want to put those people out in front. I mean, you got to keep the comms people inside, right? They're they're pure gold. Those people. You know, Reed, <laughs> God, Reed, you know how Reed hates to knock on the door. Reed. <laughs> <laughs> don't make them knock on the door. <laughs> don't send them out of head. I don't want to hold your baby while you go get your voting. <laughs> someone, <laughs> no. someone actually asked us on Twitter if there's there would ever be a uh, an instant that we would ever work on a campaign together. And I think Scott said if like Cole Caulfield was working on or running for like a mayor of somewhere. If like he Gordon, wants Napanee, we will be there for we him. Will be there, we will be there for him. Or Gordon Lightfoot. God love Gordon Lightfoot. Oh, yeah, We'd be absolutely. there for him as well. Um, uh, so, but you're starting to like pull out by the by the last two days of uh, by the last two days in a war room. You are like skeleton staff. You've got like a couple people in the comms war room. You've got some org people. You've got your lawyer that's brought in doing elections Canada, elections Ontario stuff. Um, but everyone else is out in the field. There's, Designated there's, survivors, basically. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. it's 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 it. Yeah, it is it, it is a skeleton staff. Hmm. Tell us about the last week of 2000. 2004. Wow. Glad you changed the question. Because I was afraid you were going to ask me what's the what's it like to be in charge of a campaign with eight days to go, and the only thing I've ever been in charge of with eight days to go is a bar stool and the dartboard. But um, <laughs> uh, but you were on the plane for a great last week. I don't want to I don't want to tell you about the last week. I'll tell you instead about the last two and a half weeks uh, because. There was a midpoint in the 2004 election. Just really election. the narrative, but not yourself. Right? I just, I'm just telling you, <laughs> because at the midpoint of the 2004 election, yeah. we were a government that had been um, elected since 1993. It was like whatever it had been, like 11 years. We had started out ahead, and we had dropped to like seven points maybe behind, right? Um, and we landed in Newfoundland. And we had to do a switch over of planes. So we moved from a campaign plane to a government plane because the prime minister had to go off to, I think it was the anniversary D-Day actually, um, to France. Um, so they had to go to for two days of ceremonies, interrupt the campaign to go off over there. And a bunch of us just stayed on the campaign. And we flew back on the campaign plane. And until then, the pure adrenaline of trying to fight the campaign, get through every day, all of that had like kept me going. But without the Prime Minister there, sitting in the seat in front of me and Festchuk while we would like write and rewrite notes and drink beer and have him yell at us, without any of that stimulus, I was left on that plane for like three and a half hours and I had a nervous breakdown because I was like, we're flying back into death, right? Like campaigns don't go down and then back up, right? So 
the last week of the campaign, things had turned around. By the last week of the campaign, we were back and we were on the march. And we knew, based on our numbers, your numbers that you were producing, that we were gaining nightly. And we were particularly starting to chew up blue dots like Pac-Man in Ontario. And we realized that we had a real shot. So one of the things about the last week of a campaign is a sickening feeling where you wish there was two weeks left in the campaign. Because in 2004, the worst thing about it was that it ended. In 2004, we were gaining day by day. We were picking up ground. And the beautiful thing about it was the electorate was at a position where as a longtime incumbent, they did not want to reward us. So knowledge that we were winning would result in vote dropping. But as long as we were under the radar, people were happy to vote for us. And we saw, and so there was this notion that we were in trouble. And you had like, you know, Ipsos saying, oh, the Liberals are toast, it's over. And it was all fantastic air cover for us. And if we had just, if, so how was the last week? What was the last week like? Too fucking short is the answer. Right. If the last week had been 11 days and not the typical God created earth seven days, it would have been perfect. Yeah. We would have won a majority. And we sort of, as history shows, we needed that majority. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So what were you doing? You're on the plane, you're writing speeches for the prime minister? Um, at that point, yeah. I mean, you know, I had two responsibilities fundamentally. Faustchuk and I are sort of hurting over the message. Um, and so we're writing remarks and rewriting remarks to the PM. You're inserting paragraphs. That's what that job is at that point, right? It's persuading the prime minister to not try to rewrite the entire speech. You don't want to rewrite the entire speech. We got a disciplined message, to your point, your point, we got a disciplined message. And in this next stop, we're going to tweak it this way. We are going to telegraph that we're going to tweak it this way. CTV, just want to let you guys know there's going to be two new paragraphs. This is kind of what it's going to be. We're going to go on healthcare. We've got a new proposal, right? Put that in there. Get the, pre, the PM to like, no, nope, just change those two paragraphs. We don't want to screw with anything else. Get those two paragraphs in there. Get them written in the way you want so you know that they're, everything else is gray. That's color. It's going to land. Boom, drives the news. And you get people to react to you. So that's the first job. The second job is just working the media, talking with the media. How are they feeling? What's going on? What are they angry with us about? Are they chewing on us or are they chewing on them? And it's a very simple proposition. Get the media to chew on them, not chew on us. I mean, the rule in the 2004, 2006 campaign, and I think often the rule in election campaigns, is that people are so dispirited with politicians and politics. In 2004, this was the case. People when hated When people us. were thinking about Harper, they were voting for us. Right. And when people were thinking about us, they were voting for Harper. That's exactly that what I was going to say. In That's what I was going to say. So yeah. our mission with media wasn't to get them to say what we wanted them to say. It was just to make the focus on Harper. Because if people were focused on Harper, then that, that, then that benefited us. But if people were focused on us, then it was our cell count that was going down. Jenny, what's the story behind the last week of that campaign from the conservative perspective? Very odd week. Oh, four? Yeah. Well, didn't, you guys, didn't you guys start driving on buses in rural Alberta with like nine days left or something like that? Yeah, the like Calgary that? from like Edmonton to, uh, to yeah, Calgary. Yeah, it was such a strange last week. Yeah, listen, I, 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 I'm not saying that. I was fairly junior in the 04 campaign. I was the Ontario desk, uh, which we picked up 24 seats from you guys. So uh, I'll just do a, a, yeah. a kudos on that. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I think uh, <clears throat> the last week was the last week. Jenny's regular plug for the Kretschian Liberals. <laughs> <laughs> I usually I usually start it with talking about the juggernaut. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I, no. Listen, I think that probably the uh, the number one uh, in postmortem of 2004 that we talked about was the fact that um, we ended the last two days going from Calgary to or from Edmonton to Calgary on whistle stops in you know Red Deer and Lacombe and Pinoka, uh, all towns in Alberta that that the Reform Party and the Canadian Alliance before that had one with 80% of the votes. So, um, I, you know, of course, there were changes made going into the 06 campaign where that yeah. wasn't, uh, uh, where that was the logic, the though, honest to Pete, because I don't think we've actually ever talked about this in detail, was the logic that we're locked in, it's going okay, so what we want to do now is just just keep it keep it still? Like, like, like I, was there just a misread? They had we thought loons, we were winning, they had you thought you were losing. in the arena on election night. I believe they believed they were winning. Um, 
I'm not sure they believe they were winning. Like I'll be honest, I was so no. focused on Ontario that I'm, um, I, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that's the case. I think that that I, I'm not sure there was much uh, more thought given. Like I, uh, 2004 was a good result. We held you guys to a minor minority. Um, yeah. It was. Yeah. You know, I, I like I make fun of you guys, but it was like eight months before, or a year before, where Bono and his bump. No, I know. It all seemed like, it was going to be better. Um, and yeah. uh, so, anyways, but there were a lot of changes and a lot, a lot of, of stressful. and a lot of uh, and a lot of Tried planning that happened. That would have been the difference. And a lot of planning that happened between 04 and 06. So. Well, listen. I got to say that it is a complete and utter outrage that I have been commenting on this election campaign at all, much less being critical of uh, anybody else's campaign efforts, because four years ago, four years. Ago, my liberal-led campaign culminated with me asking the leader of our party to go and make a statement that she would not be the leader of the party after the election, no matter what the result was. We made her um, take all of the blame for all of that with a week to go just to try to salvage something right. out of it. That is the worst last week I've, I've ever had. Just I, I've ever had. explicit, right? With a week to go, the premier of the province holds a press conference in a playground and says, we have lost, I will not be premier. I'm asking you, since that question is no longer in play, to focus on voting with your hearts. And our bet was, your bet, David, was that that was the best way to regain votes. And save seats. It would allow some people to come back, maybe save some seats, maybe sa maybe save some votes. But it all started with, it all started with a desperate gamble that failed horribly. So going to the campaign, I think we have not much chance to win in 2018, and the only chance we have to win is to, I think, take down this poor newcomer who seems to have lots of vulnerabilities, and. So we had been, we went into the campaign probably five points ahead of the NDP, uh, and that margin had been narrowing um, as the campaign approached. And we had a, a negative advertising campaign against Ford combined with an earned media campaign against Ford by our war room. It was research tested, we knew it would work. And we put it out there and it drove a lot of votes away from Ford, and they went to the New Democrats. And immediately put the New Democrats in second place, uh, combined with some attrition following the, of our vote to the NDP following the city TV debate. Yeah. And once we were in third, it was absolutely over. Then that story, then that narrative was cast in stone. There was no breaking it, and it took us to that last week. But that is, I mean, that whole entire writ period is a gruesome, gruesome experience. But the last week, you can't imagine what it's like to go and sit down in Kathleen's living room and tell her, for the sake of the party, this is what we think you have to do. Well, I can. Um, it, was, it was awful. The, the uh, just for people that are involved in politics or interested in politics, the decision to ask the Premier to acknowledge, to concede that she was gonna lose the campaign wasn't just unusual, like it was virtually unprecedented, right? And by the way, I will argue to people until like the last beer is poured that it did save those seven seats, that there would have been zero seats until that point. So I think that David made the right call as unconventional and courageous and horrifying as it was. Um, but it was a hugely divisive thing to do within the campaign also. Um, one of the senior people in the campaign started passing around that, that uh, YouTube clip from uh, the Dodgeball movie where Jason Bateman says, ooh, they decided to forfeit. Bold strategy. Um, so we got a lot of, lot of pushback. Um, but I think it was, um, I just, you know, David, like, I just, I think it was uh, the, 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 the best available door to walk through when all the other doors, like there was nothing but, you know, tigers and spikes uh, on the other side of. So it was, but that was a grim, grim thing. And the premier, 
fucking hardship that that placed on her, like the burden she had to carry. That was that was that was a hard hard time. Writing those remarks, watching her give those remarks, watching the response at headquarters when she gave those remarks, fetching the calls from candidates in response to those remarks, like that was that was a savage searing time. That was way worse in two thousand and six. Million times worse in two thousand and six when we lost federal government. For what did you think when you watched it? Um. I'm going to have to say for, 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 for me, for in the war room, uh, we were not all that surprised. It seemed like somewhat of a Hail Mary pass that you guys were, uh, were doing. It was. Uh, but we were, you know, at th that, that stage of the campaign, we were feeling pretty good. Our polling was good. Our voter ID was really good. Our reports on the field were very good. And so um, it wasn't going to end up being, it, it wasn't going to be anything that was going to end up affecting, I think, our campaign at that point. Right. Okay. So the timer tells me that we've used up our allotted time, and it's time for <laughs> questions and answers. So I would like to thank my great, great friends and super talents, Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed, for being with me here tonight. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Toronto Region Board of Trade for having us here tonight, putting on this event. It's so much fun for us to be together, so much fun for us to be uh, with you, uh, especially the Team Jenny group in the front. And <laughs> so awesome. And thank you all um, for coming. It's been absolutely wonderful. Now, we'll do some conversation, I guess. You guys have whistles? Yeah. I assume. <laughs> yeah. So I think Laura, first of all, thank you so much. That was amazing. We really thank appreciate you. it. Um, Laura's in the back, I believe, with a microphone. So if anyone uh, wants to ask a question, please just wave your hand. I'm just going to do uh, the kickoff question as one often does. So been You know I made a mistake in and there's a woman at the back of that hall uh -huh. named Jill Engelman who produces yes. the Hurley Burley podcast. Mm -hmm. Who's going she's she's awesome. She's the best. She's the best. Okay. And she produces Curse of Politics and Hurley Burley and uh, she's just the best. But we have as part of our show something called a blessing or a curse. And we did not do it. Would you like to? Yes. Okay. We'd like to do it. <laughs> that was my question. There we go. Ha. And there's a sound effect for this, so I've got to get this right. <laughs> and now it's time for our blessing and our curse. You got it wrong. I got it wrong. I stepped we on both got it wrong. We both stepped again. on it. I ste <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, what our <laughs> <laughs> fucking goat rodeo is. Uh, <laughs> Scott, what's your blessing or curse? Well, my, I, you know, my, my, my curse is on the Liberal campaign. I'm sorry, I'm such a broken record on this, but I just think the campaign needed to go negative. It needed to go hard at Ford right off the top. It needed to establish that there was a case for change, and that hasn't happened, and it really, I, I find it dispiriting. And I, I kind of feel, as I watch this last couple of days, I look at the Liberal um, I look, I look at the liberal tour stops, I look at the liberal message, and I look at the NDP message, and I think, yes, yeah, uh-huh, right? Like maybe execute a little bit differently, maybe round it out in a way that I would do different, but like, yeah, now, now but, but it's eight days to go, and you sort of go like, were they in a place where they go, well, I'm not gonna go there, and now they've only convinced themselves to go there, and you know, so I curse all campaigns that sort of say, I'll wait until I need to do this thing before I do this thing. Because by the time you decide you need to do it, it's too late. You actually had to do it before. And that's, I think, where the opponents of Doug Ford are now. And the goddamn guy, as my mother would say, is going to be the next Premier of Ontario again. Mm. Hey, Jenny. I didn't tell you. I'm wearing Kilo Fleur socks. Oh. Woo! Yeah. They damn all socks. belong. My cousin, my cousin Adam at the back is a huge Habs fan and loves Kilo Fleur. Wave at him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very looking man, Adam. Jenny, you got a blessing or a curse for us? Well, listen, my blessing is actually going to go to my friends in the front row here. Um, keep disciplined. Listen, stop. Don't listen to the fucking media, which I know you haven't been listening to. Uh, keep getting your vote out, and everything uh, everything looks good. So keep up what you're doing. All right, my blessing. My blessing goes out to the Liberal campaign, which is. Eight days remains a long time in politics. Remains a long time in a campaign. And 
I have seen things move in the last eight days of a campaign. I've done things to move things in the last campaign, in the last eight days of a campaign. I've put ads on the air. I've seen other people do the same thing. It is not too late to take Scott Reed's advice and bring the fucking heat. Okay? Yeah. That is my blessing. All right. I'm Days. sorry about that. Thank you. Days in May. <laughs> Wasn't that a... Uh, pretty sure that was a pretty good You know what they call that? Scattered applause. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you mentioned me, so that didn't, it didn't help. I was, I was hoping that's I what... I love the negative, positive sandwich of blessing and curse. <laughs> um, so, first question. For, we've been talking a lot, or listening to you guys talk a lot, about silver medals and the bronze medal. Seems like the gold medal for small and medium-sized businesses, who do they want to win the silver? Um, and then, who does the Ford campaign want to win the silver or bronze? So those are the two questions. And then we can go out to uh, the audience. Uh, well, listen, I, I think that uh, uh, I think that in terms of small and medium-sized business, uh, uh, you're going to want to vote for the Conservatives. I'm not sure if it matters whether the NDP or the Liberals are in first or second. Their policies in terms of businesses are pretty much the same. Uh, uh, in terms of opposition, I, 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 I'm, not sure it, uh, I'm not sure it matters. I think you're looking at two opposition parties that if they don't win this time, um, it's, it's going to be tough. If, you know, if, if Stephen Del Duca, uh, if he loses his seat, uh, uh, which uh, a lot of the polls have uh, said that, that it looks like he is, I'm not sure how he can stand stay on in the Liberal Party. Uh, and if you're in your Horvath, this is your, what, uh, fourth kick of the can? So 77th, actually. 77. 77. 77 campaign. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how you stay on. So I think, if you're, I think if you're the Conservatives, I think if you're looking at things, you're looking at potentially uh, two opposition parties, regardless of who comes in, silver or bronze, uh, that are going to be looking at having uh, new leaders in the next election. I'm going, to, I'm going to quote Herb Gray and Jason Kenney and say I dispute the premise of the question. Um, which is to say, it's astonishing, really, how little discussion there's been of the economy in this election campaign. There's been discussion of the economic impacts, affordability, how can we make this piece of life easier for you. But I had on the hurly burly, I had Peter Weltman, the uh, financial accountability officer. His projections show less than 2% growth in Ontario for as far as the eye can see, which is not enough to sustain the lifestyle we have, much less to create a better lifestyle. Um, and there's been no discussion of that in the campaign whatsoever from any of the parties. And I don't detect an economic growth plan out of anybody. If I cared about business and economic growth, I don't know who I'd vote for in this campaign. Jesus, what a downer. Well, my 24-year-old uh, son is here, so um, lots of luck. <laughs> um, you're going to be eating beans from a can uh, for the next 60 years. Um, I'll answer it uh, less uh, confrontationally than David. Um, I think if you're looking for a so well, because you're like, oh, nobody's any good on the economy. They all stink. You're, you're being mean, I think. I think okay, I'm not the mean guy. I don't he, know. If he actually just said All right, well, tell us about, about the NDP platform. Well, because <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned these people are well intended. Um, I think you, if, um, if you assume that Ford's going to win the election, um, and you're concerned from the small business, medium-sized business lobby, you want you, you want the liberals to come second. Um, and the reason you want them to come second is that they're probably more likely to win uh, the next election. If, as Jenny says, there's going to be an alternation, you know, governments don't get elect re-elected forever and ever. Um, and I also think they'll be willing to scramble. They'll be more likely to say, all hey, right, you, know, you what can't trust the liberals with small business. They might bring in a $15 minimum wage. There you go. Um, they'll reassemble their policy platform in order to be more appealing. And a fifteen dollar wage is good for everybody. Um, so I, that's where I would go. Uh, I would I would say you want to you want to put. I, I mean, but the even more practical answer, to be honest, is play futures. Who do you think is most likely to win the next election if it isn't the conservatives? I think it's probably the liberals, and therefore you'd want them because you want to influence them. All right. Are there any questions from the crowd? Oh my. Got one up front. Sorry, it's a, oh, great. Oh, my son wants to pull up on the two percent thing, David. 
Hi all, my name is Kelly, if, if you don't know me already. Um, I've got a quick question. I, I spent most of the last couple of years in Alberta where politics is easy and simple and harmonious. <laughs> so, especially right now. Um, so i got a really quick question for you, and I only want to ask it because of the way you started, and you were talking about the liberal brand. And it is a powerful brand. So why in the actual did Stephen Del Duca say, let's change our logo before the start of the campaign? I'm going to leave it to these guys. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, well, sorry, I mean, I'm sure they wanted to appear different from the previous regime. That is, would, would have been their intent, was to appear symbolically and therefore visually different from the Kathleen Wynne regime. They knew that the Ford people were going to run after Wynne more than they were frankly running after Del Duca. They have introduced the phrase Win Del Duca uh, into the lexicon of, uh, of Ontario. And so they would have been looking to refresh the look in some way, to present a different, a different image in a way. And you know, I, I, I don't think that the logo change is the reason why they've been unable to capitalize on their brand. I think the fact that the Trudeau government is complicit with the Ford, in, with Ford government's re-election is the reason they've had trouble capitalizing on the brand. You can't find a thing that Justin Trudeau has said about this, about the Liberals in this election campaign, and right up until election day, they were cutting favorable deals with them. And I think they've allowed Ford to co-opt a lot of that. And what we see is that one quarter of the people that voted for Justin Trudeau in the federal election in Ontario were voting for Doug Ford. But that's not that's, that's a, not a logo issue. But that's a question then that you Liberals should ask Justin Trudeau. I am asking him right now. <laughs> <laughs> He's right behind that door, David, so here's your chance. Uh, uh, I think two things, uh, real quick. One, it was the right decision to change the logo for all the reasons that David said. I mean, Jesus Christ, we took the thing over the cliff, so you want to change and signal change. Um, but it wasn't a very good change. I don't think the new logo is that particularly interesting, and that's, who cares, that's one person's opinion. The second thing gets at your question, though, which is that if I was going to change the the liberal brand in Ontario, I would change it to the federal liberal brand. I would change, I would make the logo look like the federal liberal logo. I would say, let's suck some of its energy. Let's borrow some of it. It's okay, Corey, we haven't mentioned you enough. It's good, break it down. <laughs> all eyes will dart to you again. <laughs> Somebody's gonna chair the end of the day call. You're gonna be <laughs> um, Fine, that's our answer. <laughs> We have a hand over here. Hi there, uh, Arthur Lofsky. Hey, Arthur. Nice hey. to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I love Super Tramp. Uh, why do you hate meatloaf so much, David? No, I can't. Yes, no, this is a, David. Yes. Why do you Oh, man. Oh, yeah, the real question. up a lot of time on that. The real question. Um, the media. Yeah. What the hell is going on with the bloody media, other than Sean O'Shea? who came out swinging, not, 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 not necessarily because of who it was. What came out swinging and asked irrelevant questions and no, no, who no, gives a fuck about it? That's not the point. Oh, well, you don't give a fuck about No, 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 them. that's not the point. At these press conferences for the Premier, they are so timid. Uh, they are not uh, asking lots of questions, and they are seemingly docile and laying back, despite what some would consider uh, a peekaboo campaign. I understand the peekaboo. But why aren't the media saying more and doing more? Um, I, I saw Colin DeBello walk in here. Does he want to take this? <laughs> I asked him about the snowmobile. <laughs> and he had to write like 16 Twitter threads about it, right? But so, Scott, I don't Scott Reed, in addition, to being our, in addition to being our NDP representative on the panel, is also our media guy. So go. Um, Look, I, I think the answer is obvious, to be blunt. I think media are really in a conflicted spot these days. Um, media is among the many institutions that are under uh, constant scrutiny and pushback and, and, oh, and open attack. And so I think you know, that balancing between challenging a campaign with questions but not taking it to the extent where you make yourself the issue, it's really awkward. And you know you're going to get challenged on that. So I think news organizations are sort of struggling to, to find that balance. And, you know, and they don't have the hand they used to. 
Right? 20 years ago, the Parliamentary Press Gallery, the Ontario Press Gallery, Queen's Park Press Gallery, would say, uh, sorry, no fucking way, not cool. And campaigns and, um, and political parties would change their practices. Now, um, they don't have that hand. So I, I'm a little more sympathetic, uh, even though I get frustrated myself, I'm a little more sympathetic to the media. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to do this job right now in a world where most people are getting their uh, news off of, uh, you know, Cousin Earl's YouTube channel. <laughs> Still a special pox on Martin Redcon's house for that piece. Well, that was particularly like, yeah. Hey, yeah. yeah. You've evolved. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm not saying you, you said you've evolved, so I'll say you've evolved. So you've evolved. We're both evolving together right now, hand in hand. <laughs> Um, we have yeah, five more like questions. Or sorry, dogs. five more problem. minutes. Sorry, Scott. Five more minutes. <laughs> sorry, I'm just gonna Three keep more questions. Until so we have to do rapid someone fire. Someone bring me a beer. So Corey. <laughs> oh shit. Uh, oh, are you I, 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 don't, oh, I don't want to make. How me. come I'm so fantastic? And uh, <laughs> please make it about Saskatchewan. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I don't want to. I don't want to make any news. I'm not going to ask you about the race. Uh, but I, I did want. I, if I was going to ask a question, it was going to be about the decision made last campaign uh, to have Wynn say that she wasn't going to run again, and you already addressed it, but I just wanted to add, add, contribute one point, which is uh, we were doing a lot of track and pulling at the time, and you guys weren't, and, uh, and you were sitting at two seats before you did that, and it absolutely was the right decision to do in terms of what you were trying to do, but I also think it's one of the bravest political decisions I've ever seen somebody take, very difficult. But, uh, you know, from our perspective, it absolutely worked. Thanks, Mark. The credit for that courage goes to Kathleen. You know, she's the one that had to do it. So I had a lot of courage. I mean, you were pretty. <laughs> I had a lot of courage. <laughs> you were right behind her, Balder the Brave. You bet. Yeah. You have to pick. We're, 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 we're too mean. Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, hey, Alex. So yesterday I turned 33 and you know, to nobody's shock, the number one issue to me is housing. Um, it seems to be the Achilles heel of this government, if you look at any public, uh, publicly available data on polling, um, but it seems that the opposition can't get a grip uh, on this issue, and I can think of a dozen reasons. I'm not going to give you those reasons because I'd like to hear your reasons, but one of them is that in a lack of a brokerage politic era, uh, you're running on such, such thin margins in terms of winning or not winning a seat that you don't want to upset your local council or your local um, mayor. And, this, since, and since housing is a local issue, you don't want to really upturn the al apple cart and it kind of spills out to, well, maybe you don't have a whole lot of credibility on this issue by the way you're talking about it. So I'm just, you know, what are your thoughts on this issue and why are the opposition parties struggling so much with it? Um, well, first of all, I'll start with a disclaimer. No matter what I say, I am not in any way in disagreement with the original sponsor of our podcast, the Ontario Real Estate Association. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're thinking of purchasing a home, you really do need the expert advice. <laughs> I'm a registered agent. <laughs> I had, I think it's, I think it's a really difficult issue politically for a few reasons. One of which is it seems most of the levers lie at the municipal level, not at the provincial level. Uh, and people, maybe for that reason, aren't really blaming the provincial government. It's, the, it's a huge issue. I don't think people know who's supposed to fix it or whose fault it is. It's not obvious it's the provincial government's fault. And it's such a complicated issue. I had uh, four relatively political experts on my podcast, hi, uh, four relatively political, uh, re relatively political experts on the housing issue on my podcast, the early early, and at the end of it, I was completely convinced that nothing would happen on this file because there were too many moving parts and there were too many disputed interests and there were too many jurisdictions involved. And all of that just makes it terrible for a political campaign. Like there's no clean message you can have about this. There's nothing you can promise at the end of the day that you will deliver out of it. It just doesn't lend itself to politics. And I think you're gonna have to hope that despite the fact that it's not being an issue in the election campaign, that it is uh, an issue for government. I don't know, you guys got anything to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, political blame and credit. 
No, or, here you're going to get credit for policy that's better. Anything else? No. We have one more we question. One last right question now. right here. So I, I'm, I think I'm maybe one of the only people that came in here from Montreal, so maybe one, only, one of the only Quebecers here. But I want to ask a question more in regards to outside of the Ontario political realm and more about the, um, the federal realm. And I don't want to put Jenny in a, in a difficult position because you're working in Pierre's campaign. No, but it seems oh, like go you're ahead. about to. I don't know. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go out of my way not to. But um, I, just because of the recent, uh, today, the Justice Minister David Lametti came out saying that probably going to be a challenge on Bill 21, probably going to be a challenge on Bill 96. I think there's a huge disconnect between the rest of Canada and the opinion of Quebecers on this issue. It's a vastly popular bill. Doesn't mean that's my opinion. Doesn't mean I support the bill. So I'm just saying, you look at opinion polling from every major pollster, they're very, 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 uh, their bills are supported by, by Quebecers by and large. I think Pierre's done a very good job in terms of being able to play to the Quebec audience. I say this as a former advisor in a Quebec liberal government. He's very impressive. And I used to say that Jean Charest was one of the best politicians in the world, somebody who makes you feel like the most important person when he's speaking to you for that five minutes he's speaking to you. My question to you in this case, how do you see this playing out? If there's a challenge from, the, from Trudeau towards this, Bill 21 and 96, how do you see, you see uh, Patrick Brown making this a huge, one of, maybe the, one of his biggest issues in the, in the leadership race? You see Scott Ageson making it a big issue like this. Jenny, I'd like to hear from you a little bit, and, your uh, colleagues would like to jump in as well. Uh, well, listen, I've, I've actually been pretty, uh, I've been pretty open in terms of uh, what I think about uh, uh, Bill 21 in terms of, uh, you're right, the Liberals did announce today on the eve of our Quebec debate uh, in, uh, that's going to start in, I don't know, three hours, uh, that uh, they would uh, issue a Supreme Court challenge, uh, uh, which is something they've been able, they could have been able to say for, uh, uh, for, for years going forward. Uh, so uh, Pierre has been very forced. If you're asking me about Pierre, if that's what you're obviously asking me about, I appreciate you coming from Quebec for the Ontario election panel to ask me about <laughs> conservative leadership <laughs> politics. Um, so if you're asking me about that, uh, Pierre has been very uh, Pierre has been very clear that he does not support Bill 21. Uh, he would not vote for it. He would not uh, support it federally. Uh, he thinks it's egregious, and he hopes that the government of Quebec uh, backs down on on doing it. Okay, our panelists need another drink. So last question. Check out Brigitte Legault on the Hurley Burley. Yeah. Francois Legault's chief organizer. I know her. Crazy yeah. persuasive and important person. Mark Smith, he's a huge fan. Thank you guys for being here. It's been a ton of fun. Uh, I, fiscal conservatism, balancing budgets, uh, responsible spending has been... Sorry, what? Your mic went out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, has, has been completely abandoned. Uh, the Liberals abandoned it last time. The Conservatives abandoned it this time. Why is it such an unpopular place to go? Well, I don't think it's, uh, listen, I don't think it's going to be. I think that uh, COVID changed the entire world in terms of how governments, uh, governments acted in terms of financial, uh, how, they inter how, they, how they handled things financially. I think we're seeing a change in that and we're seeing that with, uh, with kind of the positions that federal governments have done, you look at uh, administrations in the U.S. You look at the Trudeau administration here in terms of uh, uh, high printing money is causing high levels of inflation, which high levels of inflation are going to lead to high levels of interest rates. To your point of asking about being able to buy a house, it's it's your friends that actually have bought a house are going to have problems keeping their house because of the levels of, of uh, interest rates that are going to go up, and so it's going to have a c absolute cascading effect. And just like my friends who came into government uh, in 1993, and they worked for Prime Minister, Har Prime Minister Martin, and I would like to say I'm jealous. I doubt I'll ever work, for, I never worked for a Prime Minister who, who had such budget cuts to things like the CBC that the chair of the CBC quit based on the decisions that you guys made. And so uh, I think you're gonna see probably around the world there are gonna be very tough decisions that governments are going to have to make leading into the next couple of years. People have never cared about deficits. Most people never care about the government deficits. They say they do, kind of, because that's obviously the correct response. But they prioritize either tax cuts or spending in their pet areas over that always. And there was a very brief exception to that rule in the 1990s when a combination of economic events 
international media events and the zeitgeist of neoliberalism came together to make balanced budgets something that the public cared about only for a few years. The political consensus around balanced budgets in Canada lasted much longer than that. But what we understood in the Trudeau campaign going into 2015 was that that political consensus was no longer based on public demand, as it had been in 1995. That the public underpinning of the political consensus had disappeared. And it has disappeared. And it won't reappear until there's a crisis related to the deficit. The reason people cared about it suddenly in 1995 was because we had a horrible recession at the beginning of the 1990s. It was the, considered to be the first made in Canada recession uh, that wasn't led by the United States. We had our own recession. And uh, international agencies and newspapers were calling us a basket case. That brief constellation of events caused a, a consensus around balanced budgets. They're not a political winner. I mean, except that you need to say you want to do it. Yeah. You need to say you want to do it. If you appear not to care about it, then you're a spendthrift, and then you're not to be trusted. But as long as you have a path to balance, and that path could be three years, or five years, or 10 years, or I don't give a shit, <laughs> right? As long as you have a path to balance, that's all you need these days. And I would add one small thing to that. I agree 1,000% with David, and you'll hear everybody pay lip service to uh, balanced budgets because it is, you know, kind of uh, table stakes and a path to balance and all that sort of stuff. But I do think that economic issues are going to dominate uh, our politics and our thinking over the course of the next number of years. And it will only be if someone is, persuades the Canadian public that economic recovery and economic re well-being um, are at risk because of deficits that people will pay attention to deficits. But uh, uh, absent that, um, it, it will continue to be something that people sort of in 1977-ish ways nod their heads at as they drive past and throw uh, cash out the window. And from one comms person to another, that's the bridge I needed because the Toronto Board of Trade is going to be doubling down big time on the economy, how it's impacting our region. Uh, to make And deficit reduction. It'll be top of my list. <laughs> um, but no, we, we, we know that the OECD has put us at the bottom of the list and uh, it's, it's urgent. Uh, we're simply spending more than we're making and it's not looking great. So that's going to be our uh, priority moving forward through the, uh, the next calendar year regardless of who wins. Um, but I also want to thank you more than anything for, I think in this climate over the last uh, couple of years, it's been very hard to have good, healthy, deep conversations cross party and cross partisan and it really matters. So uh, I think uh, this, this you, you, you exemplify exactly what we should all be doing and uh, we thank you for that. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah. Better be more like us. <laughs> very quickly, thank you Jill Engelman, Michael Spitali from Air Quotes Media. Thank you Matt. Thank you, Mallory Klein, Jacqueline Wong, Nell Cretton from uh, the board and the Toronto board team. And finally, thank you, David, Jenny, and Scott. Let's go drink. All right. Hey, darling, that was awesome.